Well, good morning and welcome to Church Online. Dan Mahalik here, pastor of Cook Street Pentecostal Church, and I am thrilled that you have joined us today as we are gathered in person and online, and you're an important part of our church community, so I welcome you today. And why don't you let us know that you're there, leave a comment in the reply box there, or reply in the comment box, and we love to see uh, you there and interacting with us today. So God bless you. This morning as we gather on the 18th of July, it's hard to believe we're this far into the year already, and we're well into summer, and it's been a beautiful summer, rainy here, and we've enjoyed the heat as well, but it's been beautiful and God has been good. Trust that everyone is healthy and uh, knowing God's goodness at this time. We're going to be looking at a portion of scripture in Exodus chapter 20. We're jumping into a story. And so we're reading an event or a part of this story. And I'm going to try to build the story as we go. And uh, it's, a, it's a challenging moment for Israel. And we're going to look at that today. So let's begin with prayer and then we'll turn to God's word. Thank you, Father, for those that have joined us online and in, per- in person here this morning. And Father, we need you today. We welcome you. Have your way in our lives. Father, as we turn to your word, we ask, dear God, that in your mighty name and by your holy power, Lord, that you would touch lives today. In the name of Jesus, I ask. And Father, for those that are needing a touch from you, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would touch them and heal them. Those that are watching online, Lord, whatever needs they may, be, they may have, Father, we ask, O oh God, that you would meet them there. Reveal yourself to them as well. So God bless your word to our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Exodus chapter 20, we're jumping into uh, a story here where the Ten Commandments were just given and God's giving the law. We're in between the Ten Commandments and the rest of God's instruction. And there's a little break here in the story. It seems that it repeats itself, but it's actually one event And the first time they focus on one thing and the second time now they're focusing on something and they're building this story uh, as they come back. It's like a flashback in a TV show or a movie as you are uh, brought in and given more information along the way. So beginning in verse 18, we're going to read just a few verses there. It says this, when the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, They stood at a distance, trembling with fear. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but don't let God direct us, speak directly to us or we will die. Don't be afraid, Moses answered them, for God has come in this way to test you and so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. As the people stood in the distance, Moses approached the dark cloud where God was. As I was reading there, flashes of lightning. (laughs) On Canada Day weekend, the kids bought some fireworks. We thought, oh, this is going to be fun. So thank you to Bob and Eric and the family there for letting us come out to their farm. And we're setting off our first big cluster you know, the one you pay $8 million for. No, I'm kidding. And, and, and they set it on the ground, and I thought, I'm going to video this. So I pull up my phone, and I'm, I'm holding it, and I see the flash of light in the, in the sky, in the dark sky. And I'm waiting for the second one. So I get, and there it was, and I'm videotaping that. Then I hear it. I'm going, where is it? And then this commotion, and people are yelling. It fell over, and it would shoot, and it would spin, and it would shoot, and it would spin, and it would shoot. Flashes of lightning. (laughs) And we were ducking and running. (laughs) We learned from that. Reminds me of this encounter at the mountain. There are scary moments in our lives. Uh, 365 Sports or Sports 365, they set up the water slide down Hospital Hill here. It was about half a kilometer long or so. And... They had a few other activities or events, and one of them was a three-story jump at a platform. It was about 30 feet in the air, and um, a pump is pumping air into this big cushion. And people were paying to jump off into the air. Sounds like a great idea, right? (laughs) I didn't think it was such a great idea, but still, I'm standing there going, 30 feet, really, that's all? That doesn't look so bad. Ever notice that it doesn't look so bad from where you're standing? You know, until you walk a, a mile in someone else's shoes, it's a different perspective. 
And I noticed the guy volunteering at the top. And I go, oh, I know that guy. And he's helping everybody. And there's a few people turning back and going down. And, I'm, you know, I don't like heights, you know. And he looks over and he sees me as there's a lull. And he goes, Dan. I'm like, is he talking to me? <laughs> I'm looking around, I'm not quite sure. And he's calling again. And he's calling, he says, come here. I'm going, me? He goes, yeah, you, get up here. I'm thinking, what? And so the lady running, the, she goes, you better get up there. I'm going, okay, I'm glad it doesn't look so bad. I get to the top, and all of a sudden, as you're looking at the rooftops of the neighborhood, you're going, this doesn't look so good all of a sudden. And I remember as my turn was coming, how uncomfortable and how horrible <laughs> that moment was. <laughs> and, and he says, okay, it's your turn. So I figure I'm going to go to the edge. I look down, and it's a lot farther down than it looks up. And I'm thinking, how am I supposed to land in this thing? You know, Brady made it look easy. He just runs and flips in the air and lands on it. I'm, I'm going, I'm going to break my neck. I just know it. <laughs> what do I do? And I thought, I'm going to stand here forever because I've been on that as a child on the diving board. You know, you're waiting and you just don't go. I've had those moments that I've just froze. And I thought, this is going to happen again. I'm just going to go. And I remember taking a breath and throwing my leg out because... That was the only option. It was like me pushing myself off. <laughs> and I flew through the air, landed, it's all fine. And I remember that moment of decision and thinking, you just gotta do it, and I threw myself off. That moment there. And we have scary moments. Swimming, ever have one of those? Or in, drifting in the snow in your car as you come around the corner and you go, and this is not the direction I want to go. You know, those moments when you're standing on the ladder and you feel your knees shaking the ladder. I feel that. I don't know about you, but <laughs> I feel those moments. And, and it was a moment of decision. And here we are, and Israel is at a moment of decision in the midst of paralyzing fear. God, they've been on quite a journey with God. Up to this point, God showed up. He heard their cry. He understood their need. He, he saw their oppression, and he says, I'm going to do something about it. And he goes, and it miraculously, through the power, powerful plagues that brought them out, then he brings them into the wilderness. There's a cloud by day and a fire by, pillar of fire by night. And they see God miraculously, powerfully leading them. And then they, they come to the Red Sea. And there, as the Egyptian army runs at them from behind, and they sit there in fear and terror, what will we do? God says, I have a way for you. And he opens up the Red Sea. They cross on dry ground to safety, and he set them free. Over and over, they have this moment of God coming to the rescue. And it was an incredible journey that they have had. And now they stand at the mountain. This is the place. This is the place that they were to go. This is the whole point. When God met Moses on the mountain in the fiery bush, he says, bring my people here to worship me. The message to Pharaoh was, tell my people to let the, tell, uh, tell Pharaoh, let my people go so that it may, may come here to worship me. And now they are here. I don't know what they were thinking this was gonna be. You know, they see God in his power and his goodness and they're thinking, okay, he's cool, he's powerful, this is nice. And maybe in their mind they're thinking something lovely, something nice, something glorious. I don't know what they're thinking. I have no idea. But I, maybe it was going to be a religious service. They're thinking, okay, let's get this over with so we can carry on. I don't know. I don't know. But all of a sudden they come to this mountain and as they approach, God says, now this is the way you need to come. And he warns them. We're off to a, a, a start, aren't we? I don't know what they were imagining, but all of a sudden God says, if you cross this, you're going to die. What? Hmm. And all, I believe that this was a moment that maybe they didn't fully expect. I don't know. I don't know. But God says you must prepare. And it's interesting. We prepare for a lot of things. We prepare for interviews. We prepare for birthday parties. We prepare for the birth of a child. We prepare. And there's other things we don't prepare for, like that test or exam that we should have prepared for, or, or marriage even. You, know, you, know, it, you plan for success, you know, and so preparing for certainly does help us with that. But God says you must prepare. You must consecrate yourselves. Amen. 
That's a word we don't use today very often. If you went to the store and said, you know, I, I was consecrating today. Go, what? <laughs> uh, and, you know, so we may not know what that means, but it's to sanctify, to make holy. It's to bring myself prepared to properly approach holy God, perfect God. And this is what he's telling them. And there's some instructions. He says, you're going to wash your clothes. You're going to set up boundaries. You're going to know where you can go, where you can't go. And, and so we see that in Exodus 19, 9 to 15. And, and he gives it to the people. And, you know, as I thought about that, I thought, do we still prepare for the Lord today? Do we prepare to come into his presence? And preparing for communion. We take time to evaluate, we, we bow our heads, we, we contemplate, we confess. You know, there are moments where to prepare. I remember growing up, you know, a European home, we went to a Yugoslavian church on Sunday afternoons many times. And in Europe, I remember seeing it too, as people would come in, they would sit in their seats and in a moment of silent prayer, they would bow their head at their seat before they did anything else. And I thought, maybe that's something we should be doing. Maybe we should be preparing. And they were preparing. God is calling. The criteria was high and the guidelines were clear and there was no room for error. And the cost of failing was, uh, or to, failing to comply was death. That sounds awful serious, doesn't it? And I'm not sure, as they realized this is the whole point of God led, bringing us out of Egypt to make us his people, that we might worship him here and worship him. We talked about that last week. We'll make reference to it. I'm not so sure that they thought this is how it was going to turn out. And suddenly, if they had any lovely ideas, now became dark and frightening. And this is where they were. Why did this happen? I've often asked over and over, why? Why were they faced with this earth shaking beneath them? Why were they faced with the billowing smoke? Why with the cloud coming, the trumpet sound and the lightning? Why? You know, for Moses, it was a burning bush. And God calls out, take your sandals from your feet. You are on holy ground. You see where God's presence is? Holiness. He, he sanctifies it. And our lives are the same. And I thought, why did he do this? Was he intending to frighten them, or to scare them, to kind of weed out, you know, the, the brave and the determined versus those who were not? You know, is that... And, and we could probably speculate a lot, but I think if we just read the Bible and let the Bible speak, I was thinking about Egypt. And I thought about the power of God, that how he revealed himself to Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. And it was in mighty acts, powerful acts, supernatural acts, miraculous acts. And it seemed to be the method, the language that people understood. And they came from Egypt and they understood this type of deity that is powerful and has authority. And I believe that in a sense, God was speaking to them in a way that made sense to them, except it was more than they have ever seen before. And it was frightening. Has God done it before? I believe God reveals himself to you. I believe it in many ways at different times in your life, in your day. I believe God is revealing himself. I look at Elijah. Elijah, is, as he's going to meet with God and he hides in the cleft of the rock and there's a mighty wind. And he's thinking, oh, God's going to be in this powerful wind. No. Either there's this earthquake and it's shattering, shaking the earth around him. And he's saying, oh, God is coming. No, not there. And then there's a fire and, and it says God wasn't in the fire. And then there was a still small voice. Why? Why a still small voice? Because Elijah needed that. Elijah understood that. That is how Elijah needed God at that moment. It's interesting how God knows how to speak to us. And he knows how to get our attention. Jesus spoke in parables so that people would say, hmm, that is so intriguing. I wonder what he means. And to draw them closer. But you know, Hundreds, thousands didn't bother to ask. Right. It's amazing to see God appear to Israel in a way that they could know him, that they could understand him. How did he reveal? God appeared to them as one who is far greater than all others. Kind of talked about that a little bit last week. 
but the greatness of God, the holiness of God. He is so far above us. And we read that scripture. I think it's Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. And then it says his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are far beyond our thoughts, right? He's not like us. And as we see him as far greater than all others, this defines us and how we will serve him, how we approach him. I think of Psalm 100, speaking of approaching the Lord. Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. That is so true of the Lord. It is a celebration to know him. It's a great thing to know him. It's fullness of joy to know him. And he invites us to know his loving mercy that never ends. His steadfast love knows no end. And he invites us to know him. And we love it that we can think of God and coming to him with thanksgiving and praise, coming boldly, Hebrews 4, 16, come believing, expecting, Mark eleven twenty six, 26, singing and dancing as we read, shouting with joy and celebration and gladness, Psalm 20, 122, so many ways to approach God. But then there's Hebrews 12 and 28. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. Oh, there's more to it. We're to come and humble ourselves before him. We're to declare his greatness. Psalm 34, we're to be intentional. Uh, Hebrews 10, 25, we're to come in faith. uh, Ephesians 2, 8, prepare to listen and respond to him. And, And repentant heart and attitude. Think of all the ways as he's so far greater and he's revealing to them because of who I am. And I'm just giving you a glimpse, God says to Israel. This is the requirement. And we're to come. And he still points that out to us today. God revealed himself also as one who is holy and calls his people to be holy. And we, we spent a lot of time on this last week. Let me read 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. It's the same expectation in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. It says in 1 Peter 1.15, But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say you must be holy because I am holy. And as a result, you know, our lives are living worship to him. And we talked about this last week, Romans 12 and 1. So dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies as uh, to God because of all he has done. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. This is your spiritual act of worship. And so God is coming to them and he's revealing that he is far above all and that he calls us to be holy. And that affects uh, how we exist and how we come before him. But it also reveals his justice. I remember many times, one person in particular that I know in these days, but uh, who says, you know, it's amazing. What goes around comes around. (laughs) You know, it's amazing. You know, you 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 are good to others, they're good to you. You know, karma. I'm going, karma. I'm going, no, that's God, that's Bible. You know, Galatians 6, verses 7 to 9 says this: don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. The justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Aha, karma, eh? It's the justice of God every day active in your life. And in Romans 12, 11, it says, For God does not show favoritism. In verse 6, 16 of the same chapter, this is the message Paul says, I have proclaimed that the day is coming when God, through Christ Jesus, will judge everyone's secret life. God is just. And he is revealing to them there is a standard. God who is good, kind, loving, merciful, he is also going to judge and make things right. And he's revealing it to them at this point. And as he reveals himself as far above and is called on their life to be holy as he is holy and that he is just and he will deal with things appropriately, what is Israel's response? You would imagine they're thinking, wow, 
God is absolutely amazing, isn't he? God's going to look after us. He's going to make things right for us. He's going to provide for us. He's going to do what he's promised for us because he can do it. You would think that maybe they'd say, all right, we get to be his people. We're going to be uh, his kingdom of priests, his holy nation, his special treasure, as he announced to them. We talked about that last week. They might have said that, you would imagine, possibly. But it was different. I see it more like this. They were scratching their heads thinking, what did we get ourselves into? That's more, I think, of what it was like. It's one thing to make us a commitment that we weren't serious about, all right? You say, oh yeah, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And then realizing how important it is what we do and being responsible to that promise. Amen. It's another thing to come to a realization of the magnitude of a decision. Like when you wake up on your marriage day and you're thinking, holy cow, I'm gonna be married today. Am I ready for this? A lot of people get cold feet and that's natural. And, and you're feeling the magnitude of it. And they were feeling the magnitude of what they said. They said, Moses, tell God we will do everything he says. And then he reveals himself. They're going, oh my, God is big. I can't escape him. And all of a sudden, what do they do with this? We're gonna jump ahead several chapters to Exodus 32. And we're going to see their response to God. In Exodus 32, and beginning in verse 1, if you have your Bible, you can turn there or you can see it on the screen. And this is how the people respond to God, because now it's been about 40 days, I believe. Moses is with God. They're hearing God speak. They're seeing God's presence. And after all of this, this is what they say. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain. They're looking at their watches. The sermon's not over yet. What is this guy thinking? We missed lunch, right? How, how long? This guy's been up there like forever. They gathered around to Aaron. Okay, this is number two in charge. Okay. <laughs> come on, they said. Make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So Aaron said, take the gold rings from, your, from the ears of your wives, sons, and daughters and bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, belted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. When he saw it, when the people saw it, they exclaimed, O oh, Israel! These are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Aaron saw how excited the people were, so they built an altar in front of the calf. Then he announced, tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. I read that and I shake my head. I'm going, what is wrong with this picture? This, these are the gods that brought us out of the land of Egypt. God is on the mountain, Moses is there, but no, this golden calf, which we just made, is what we're going to worship as, God, as the gods that brought us out of. There's a lot of similarity between this moment and their life in Egypt, okay? Uh, worshiping this cow, there is, there's a similar god in Egypt, gods, uh, plural, uh, very much Egypt, life in Egypt, and and all of a sudden, Moses isn't around. So we're going to go back to what we know. You know, when Jesus died and they put him in the tomb, you know, some of the disciples, Peter says, I'm going fishing. I'm going to go back to what I was doing before. And there seems to be this opportunity for going back to the old way of things. After all of this, they make this calf. And I thought, what on earth has happened here? What can we learn from this? I think one of the greatest things I believe we have to realize is that fear will never motivate you to love God and honor him with your life. Amen. It will never. You can't serve God in fear, and if you try, you will fail. Amen. I think that is 
one of the main points here for us. And you might listen to what I just said and think, but Pastor Dan, doesn't the Bible tell us that we need to have the fear of the Lord? And yes, there are many places in the Bible that talks about that. But is being afraid of God and the fear of the Lord the same thing? You see, they were afraid and they withdrew and they stood at a distance while Moses went in. And there is a difference between the two. The fear of the Lord is a love, it's a respect, it's a reverence for God. And it will cause you to say, you know, how could I ever do this? I don't want to disappoint God. I want my life to please him. He's been so good after all he has done. How could I do blank and displease him with my life? I don't want to do that. I love him too much. And, and the fear of the Lord is firmly rooted in your love for God. You know, the reality of the justice of God is something that is fearful for all humanity. It is. The reality of eternity with God or without God, that's, that's something to be uh, to respect and to be wise about. Yes, and there is some fear in there. Proverbs 8 and 13, and you'll see it on your screen. All who fear the Lord will hate evil. Therefore, I hate pride and arrogance, corruption and perverse speech. And you know... As I thought about this idea of fear versus the fear of the Lord, I thought, Jesus had the fear of the Lord, didn't he? In Isaiah chapter 11, in the first three verses, and you're going to see similarity to Isaiah 53, it says, Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him in the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. And that's speaking of Jesus. And Jesus never was afraid of the Father. He loved the Father. He spoke so lovingly of the Father all the time. Fear, being afraid, and the fear of the Lord are not the same. It is to hate evil. And because we love God, we hate evil. And look what Moses says to the people of Israel as they have this opportunity now to draw near. Don't be afraid, Moses answered them, for God has come in this way to test you so that, you, so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. Amen. You see, God is saying, come near. And Moses says, don't be afraid. He is actually saying, don't be afraid, draw near. And, and sometimes we confuse this idea of fear and, and uh, his holiness, and we kind of mix it up, and it brings confusion to us. But you see, we are to come. Why was God drawing them? Because he loved his people. Amen. Why did he bring them there? Because he loved them. He says, I love my son Jacob. And that's Israel, the sons of Israel. He loves them. He cares about them. And now he's revealing himself to them. And now he's saying, what will you do with me? Up until this point, what were they doing? Up until this point, they were along for the ride. They were on the journey. God was taking care of everything. All they had to do is follow. And now God stops them and he says, what will you do with me? And he draws them and says, come close to me. And they're like, no, nah, we don't want to go there. We're afraid of you. And you know, I believe as long as we're determined to remain in sin, we will be afraid of God. But when we are desiring to honor the Lord, even though it's fearful, we draw in. And Moses drew in. And you know what the message of Exodus, I believe, is? And the entry into the promised land? I think it's summed up in these verses in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, Joshua says, we will serve the Lord. Amen. You know, this was a moment of decision in the midst of fear. Yes, it was a frightening moment. Yes, it was concerning. But it was a moment of decision, and this moment of decision, will I respond to God, will I draw near, is what will either make it or break it situation. That's what it is. And, 
And God is still calling us today. And if we bear his name today, we every day get to, get to prove our devotion to him in the way we speak, think, the way we use our money, treat people, the relationships we keep, the movies we watch, the fantasies we conjure, you know, the attitude that we have towards our family, uh, how we treat our spouse, how we lead our children, our family, all of this. And we want it to reflect Christ. And it begins in decision. Our success in the Lord is, is set on decisions. God gives us the opportunity. What will you do as he reveals himself to you? It comes to a moment of decision. It's life changing. I know in my own personal life, there are times when I'm thinking, oh yeah, Lord, you know, I shouldn't have done that. Please forgive me. And I find myself repeating it. I'm thinking, what is going on? So I say it again, Lord, please forgive me. I shouldn't have said that or done that or behaved that way, whatever. And I'm, then I'm going, I did it again. What is going on? And as God is speaking through his word and he's, he's, he's convincing me that sin is not right and this and that, I'm going, God, I have been selfish to do this my way. God, I have been rebellious because I've been doing this instead of what you want. And God, I can't explain it. It is what it is. And I, and I confess that to the Lord. And I find that as I ask him for his help and say, God, I can't do this on my own. I need you. Amen. All of a sudden, I wake up the next day and I don't feel the need to respond as I did the day before. I'm thinking, what is the difference? And I realize there is a decision in there. And you know, these people at a moment of decision, you know what repentance is? It's turning and going a different way. And 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. And there's no regret in that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. You know, as they came to this moment of decision, they did not turn away from their old way. Right. Because we see it in, verse, in chapter 32. They fully embraced it again. And in this moment of decision, they chose wrong. And that's why they continued. It began with, no, Moses, you tell us. And you know what God said to Moses? Moses, you better get back down to the camp because the people that you led out of Israel... He says, I'm going to destroy them. And Moses argued with them, God, how will people know your greatness and who you are? And I wonder if that was a moment of testing for Moses as a leader. There, as he had the opportunity, as God said, I'm going to make a people out of you. Forget them. I'm done with them. And Moses, I believe it was a moment of decision. He says, God, that's not me. You promised that. that this is a different plan that you have. And this is about you. And I believe in that moment, and it's an interesting verse afterwards, it says, and God changed his mind. Okay, that's a, that's a topic for another Sunday. <laughs> and, and repentance, a moment of decision. Philippians chapter 2, we're just going to finish up with these, this last verse here. Philippians 2.12, dear friends, you always followed my instruction when I was with you. This is Paul speaking to the Philippian believers. You always followed when I was there. And now that I'm away, kind of like Moses is away, it's even more important. He wants them to continue to obey. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Paul is saying this right after he says, if we are, if there is any, you know, any like spirit or any, uh, in, chapter, in verses 1, 2, and 3, and he says, then, then be the way you should treat each other, it should be the same as Christ, and he speaks about Christ, and he says, and now he says, now work out your salvation, obeying with deep reverence and fear. And he goes on to continue after challenging them to have the attitude of Christ to continue on honoring God, even in his absence. And you know, we have moments of decision all through our life as we work out our salvation. Amen. And I say all of this because I believe you're believers here. Amen. And I believe that God is still revealing himself to you because you are not where God wants you to be yet. Right. You are today, 
but he's got something more for you later today and tomorrow and a week from now and a month. And, and our relationship with grow, our grows and our understanding of him grows and we, our faith grows. And, and as we grow, and how do we do that? It's because God is speaking to us. God is revealing. And you have moments of decision. And you're working out your salvation. And, and you have to choose rightly because it affects your life. You know, I worry as a pastor when I don't see people come into church, I'm going, what's going on in their life? That's a moment of decision. Because before long, they're not going to church. It's concerning. And it's about their faith. It's a decision they made one day, which led to another decision, which led to another one, and they have a change of mind. It's unrepentance. (laughs) It's undoing the decisions you have made for God. And it's important that today... That we take the opportunity as God reveals himself to you. Don't take it for granted. One day it might be a powerful revelation of of God's power. Oh God answered my prayer. He's so good. He's amazing. And we're thrilled and excited. And other times it's through a hardship. And he's speaking of his patience or his faithfulness or his love or whatever it is. And we can praise him in the moment. But then the next time we face a hardship, we forget all about it. What have we learned? We continue to grow. We continue to draw near. And we fear the Lord because we love him. We need to love him. It's a love relationship that God is looking for you so that you may be his people. And he will make your life. He will do it. He is giving you the desire to be that person. Let him do it. Respond to him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning as we come to this portion of scripture and realize how much you love your people. You still love us today. And Father, for us, as we read the story, we may feel, Lord, like this is, this is a scary moment and we may not see it the way they see it or the way that you see it, Lord. God, you love them and you spoke to them in the way that they understood and you are careful to do that for us. And we have moments of testing, moments, Lord God, of decision. And it affects our lives, O oh God. And I pray, dear Father God, that we would learn to listen to your voice. That God, that we would develop a love for you. You said to the church in Ephesus in Revelation to rekindle that first love. Amen. Father God, we need to make the effort to love you. And are we loving you, growing in our love for you, that we might fear the Lord and follow you as you have called us to, Lord. We need to make a choice, Lord, all the time choices, that we might seek you and find you as you have promised we would. So, Father, today as we take this time in your word, speak to us, Jesus. Have mercy on us, O God. Father, as we sit and reflect on life and maybe what your spirit is saying to us today, maybe we need to repent, ask for forgiveness, Lord, because we've neglected you or have been careless in our relationship with you. And Lord, I thank you what it says in 1 John 1, 9, that you forgive us as we confess our sins. You're faithful to forgive and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We thank you, God, and by faith we accept what you told us, Lord. And that through Jesus Christ, you make us righteous. Your work doesn't end, Lord. And so we choose you today. Father, I pray for those online as they have an opportunity. What are they going to do with you, Lord? As as the screen is turned off, the video is over. What will they do with you, Lord? I pray that they would choose every day to respond to you as you speak to them as well. So, Father, we surrender our hearts to you today. Help us to be faithful to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. For the glory of your name, we thank you for your good work and that you are faithful to us to lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us online. I'm so glad that you were able to be with us here today. May the Lord be with you. If you'd like to give a call and talk, I'd, be, I'd love to hear from you or send an email and I'll reply. God bless you. And we will see you next week. Take care now. Bye.